Sometimes in a business deal, the negotiations are over, the terms are clear, your choice is simple. You either take it or leave it. As a guidebook for the race of life, we must either take the Bible as it is or reject it outright. Picking only the good parts won't do. To find out why, stay with us. From Chicago's Moody Church, this is Running to Win with Dr. Erwin Lutzer, whose clear teaching helps us make it across the finish line. Our series is called Seven Reasons Why the Bible is God's Word. Dr. Lutzer's introductory message is called When God Speaks. And as we begin today, we hear about our primary choice. And as we shall show in some future messages, you must either believe the whole thing or you must doubt the whole thing, but you can't pick and choose. You can't pick and choose. Now, the Bible says in Psalm 19, thy testimonies are sure, they're dependable. In a world in which many opinions are being expressed, in a world in which many people are living with their own privatized religion, trying to find out reality, trying to probe behind the barriers. Isn't it wonderful to know that we have a sure word of prophecy? It is a sure word. I don't agree with everything that Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote, most assuredly, but he did say this, Truth is tough. It will not break like a bubble at a touch. Nay, you may kick at it all day long like a football, and it will still be round and full in the evening. Well, let me tell you something. If the Bible is a sure word, if it is dependable, we should be able to analyze its history. We should be able to even analyze wherever it touches science, like on the creation issue about which there shall be a message, God willing, in this series. And we should be able to analyze it from the standpoint of its prophecies. We should be able to look at it as many different ways as you want to check out a document. And it should always turn out to be reliable because it is a sure word. It's a sure word. What do we mean when we say the Bible is God's word? We mean that it is dependable that when the men sat down and they wrote it, they wrote under divine supervision and inspiration and God guarded them from error. Secondly, underline the word shining, shining. You'll notice that the text tells us here that the word of God, verse 19, we have the prophetic word made more sure. Peter says, you know, the fact that we're up in the mountain, it confirmed the prophecies of the Old Testament. That's what he meant. And uh, just like God predicted what Jesus Christ would look like in his coming glory, Peter says, we were there and we saw it. But now notice it says, we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining, there's the second word, in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. It's a shining word. Peter uses a very vivid expression in the original Greek. He says it is like a light that shines in a very murky place. It is in a murky place, Peter says. And uh, events in life are murky. Uh, the situations that people get themselves into are murky. The human heart is murky. The human heart is murky. And, and the scriptures are like a light shining in a dark place. They finally illuminate all of the darkness and the dissipation and the evil and the questions of this world. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. When I was a boy on the farm, I used to follow my father at night, and he would have a lantern. Now, the lantern didn't give a lot of light. It didn't illuminate 
the whole farmyard, but it gave us enough light to find out where the path is. It gave us enough light to make sure that the next step that we took would be a solid one. We were not going to fall off of, from a rock. And so that's the way the Word of God is. It doesn't tell us all of the answers that we would like to know. It doesn't reveal to us all of the mysteries that God has in his person. We wouldn't even be able to accept that. That's something that we're going to study for all of eternity. But what the Bible does do, and it's important that it does, is that, is that it guides us in the darkness of this world. And it keeps pointing us to Christ who said, I am the light of this world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Over in Jerusalem, under the city, is a place where tourists seldom get to. There are what is known as the quarries of King Solomon. Not a very accurate historical designation because those were probably not his quarries, but that's the name that is given. There are huge caves, caves as large as your house. And some of us were in those caves and we were with a man who said, uh, I'm not lost. I'm not lost. He said, I've been in here 40 times, 40 times. But he was lost. But he was lost. And we're thankful that some of us remembered where it is that we had come in and where the tunnels were that would eventually get us out because you wouldn't want to be lost there for too long. But the thing that helps us, of course, is the flashlight. How do you get out of a cave without a flashlight? And some of you in your darkness and in the dismal experiences and the sheer emptiness of life, you say, where is the light? Where is the light? The Word of God is like a lamp shining, shining in a dark place, to which you do well to pay attention. Notice that, folks. Finger on the text, you do well to pay attention to what the Word of God says. As to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. And when he thinks of the dawning of the day, he thinks of the return of Jesus Christ. And before